Hello and welcome to Masterclass number 26. My name is Maura Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute and today's topic is all about creating thriving neighbourhoods and, and looking at some of the lessons and the insights from eco-villages around the world. This is a topic that's really close to my heart and I'm really excited to be exploring this with you here today. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Um, welcome back too to everyone who's been to these before and a particular shout out to everyone who's here as part of the Permaculture Educators program. You're very welcome to open up the chat and start to introduce yourself and, and keep that open and, and use that as a place that you can share resources and ask questions throughout this whole session. That's of course if you're watching this live. If you're here and watching this as a recording, you, you're very welcome to be putting your comments and, and introductions and, and questions in the section below. So before I go any further though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which I'm meeting with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the land and encourage us all to, to think about inhabiting this place and to re-indigenize the way that we think about inhabiting our neighborhoods. So the idea of creating thriving neighborhoods is something that you know, a lot of eco-villages and sustainable communities have been talking about for a long time, but it feels ever so more uh, present, this conversation now, because so many of us around the world, well, pretty much everyone, is localised because of COVID. And it's interesting to notice what's been happening around the world as a result of this. So for a long time, the ecological footprint is being mapped and and we've noticed over the years that since 1969, when it was pretty much the last time when we were living a one planet way of life, that uh, we've now got to a situation where to meet everyone's consumption patterns and to absorb everyone's wastes in the world, it takes 1.7 Earths. What does that mean? We only have one Earth. Well, what it means is that pretty much last year by July 29th, we were in overshoot. So everything that was done globally from that point onwards is actually eating into future generations uh, resources, into other species resources, in depleting the ecological system and balance. Interestingly, what's happening this year, because of the reduction of consumption and, and flying and industry and all of those things, that we've contracted our way of life into a more localised way of life, a more neighbourhood way of life, that we've actually seen a massive shift in the date, the overshoot date, to August 22nd. It hasn't been like that for a very long time. So what this tells me is that actually living a more localized life is what we desperately need in the world right now. And how can we do this in a way that is not just surviving, but thriving? And that's kind of really the topic of what I'd like to explore with you today. I was first really switched on to this way of thinking about living in sustainable communities when I visited Ladakh and I volunteered there for a long time in the in the 90s 1992 and 1995 and really explored what it meant to live in a sustainable community and I I'd researched it before I knew about it I talked about it but I hadn't experienced it and it it was such a powerful thing to see how a community can and does thrive uh, in a local way where everything comes from the earth and goes back to the earth and how you can have richness and abundance without money and through the gift economy and through local food systems and thinking about localized design that, that was using local materials that were available. There was something really amazing here that I'd never experienced before growing up in Melbourne. And so I started to ask the question, what, what does a sustainable community look like? back here in Australia or in other parts of the world that had gone down the route of of development and pro you know so-called progress what did it look like so fast forward a couple of decades and here I am living in crystal waters an eco village uh, in the sunshine coast hinterland based on permaculture principles and the idea here is that there's a real balance between ecological restoration in growing food and growing community too so when we first arrived here there were no trees Pretty much there was a, just a degraded landscape, a lot of erosion, the riparian zones had been cleared. There was hardly any animals, hardly any life. And this is transformed. So we now have um, 
about half of the property that has been put back into a forested area. The rainforest is returned into gullies. The riparian zones have been uh, repaired. There's been about 17 lakes installed throughout Crystal Waters that have brought so much life into the place. We have 170, I think, species of birds have been counted recently. There's kangaroos and wallabies and and my daughter even noticed a platypus the other day. So it's this idea of actually creating and nurturing communities that are in connection with place, connection with nature, that have the purpose of actually connecting with each other, growing food and restoring um, nature in, in place. And so this is my part of my place where this is my office, actually, where I'm sitting right now inside that building, uh, a solar paneled home uh, owner built uh, office building that's surrounded by food and chickens and, and nature and my children are involved in in helping me manage this garden as well. So within Crystal Waters the idea of a thriving neighborhood is one that has food in abundance growing all over you know perennials and fruits and bush tucker plants so food for nature and food for us and that the homes are, are simple and owner built using natural or um, recycled materials or recyclable materials um, as much solar um, generating as much electricity as what we use collecting the water dealing with waste there's no pipes in or out of crystal waters so I wouldn't say that we're completely sustainable yet here within crystal waters and but the aspiration is there and the idea that living together and creating um, this as a collective project I think is what what is the most important part and the lesson I think that I'd like to share from this is that when you start to work together with other people with the intent of restoring your neighborhood with the intent of growing more food than you can eat with the intent of generating more electricity than what you consume and collecting more water than you need and dealing with your own waste that I think is what is kind of one of the in interesting lessons out of crystal waters and also that that it's a beautiful and nourishing place to live that part of the restoring the landscape and the ecological systems and rehydrating the landscape has also created beautiful places to be they've created um, breeding space for migratory birds and, and and a habitat for turtles and it's wonderful what you what you discover as you're exploring these places and also a great place to grow up so the kids here really thrive in just exploring the river and the, and making fun out of whatever they can find around and going camping down the creek. And part of creating thriving local neighbourhoods too is understanding the deep history of place. What's happened in your community and how you can begin to understand the, the natural cycles, the, the cultural seasons the local foods and really start to connect in more deeply that way. So spending time in your own bioregion, in your own neighborhood to get to understand what that is, is such an important place of creating thriving local neighborhoods. And so that means then too, all of the forests and all the rivers and all of the, all of those natural spaces are all open and accessible and people can walk through and people find their own special spaces by the river and that becomes like a meditation space for someone or someone might go hiking up into the, into the rivers. So there's open and accessible, there's no fences and it's not cut off. And so this sense of living in the commons and that the commons is not just, and it's more than human. So it's thinking about for the common good is such an important part of thinking about how to cultivate sustainable neighborhoods. The last little picture there is in a place called Fairview Gardens, right in the middle of the suburbs in California, in Goleta, California, where a group of people got together and put aside some land for farming. And so right in the middle of the suburbs is this beautiful open farm that gets managed for um, growing food, education, um, offering people a, an open space, a, a rural type feeling open space that they come to from the suburbs around. So this land trust idea of keeping these spaces that are common spaces for the common good are really important whether you're in a rural area or in an urban area or whether you can start to reimagine some of the places that are in and around your neighborhood wherever you are 
because an eco village concept or a, or a creating thriving neighborhoods idea doesn't you don't have to be in an eco village like here at crystal waters to do it it can happen anywhere so where are the common spaces in and around you it could be a rooftop it could be the verges it could be a park down the corner it could be um, a schoolyard where are the commons where are the commons exist that you can reimagine and re-inhabit in a way that can start to help cultivate a sense of um, neighborhood and connection and connection too to indigenous cultures of your place so this is Hockerton Housing Project, a series of five homes that are actually underground homes so that it stays at a constant temperature throughout. And together they've been able to create some really interesting things that they do collectively. So because they've condensed their footprint, they have much more shared open space. So they have space for a lake. They have a, a shared community garden space. They have a large windmill which produces all the electricity that they need for their homes as well as producing surplus that they have a um, an electric vehicle that they share uh, to go into town and, and to get to the local um, train station for example so by collect coming together and having this shared space it means that there's so many other possibilities for connection that happen so further south in england there's another community that we visited more recently which is called Bowden House. And this is just outside of Totnes. So it was a large home with a series of outbuildings which have been transformed into an amazing community, um, more of a co-housing type model. So the main house is actually divided up into a series of apartments with shared lounge room and shared kitchen. And out in the other areas that were the stables and outbuildings, they've been created into um, smaller homes and then they have a separate area too that they have um, large community gardens here but then also um, a community playhouse and meeting area so the opportunity by coming together and creating these environments means that maybe your own personal footprint is smaller but you get much larger opportunity for connection and for working together so that you know it's not just entirely your responsibility to look after the garden you have a whole lot of people to work with to do that um, and it's not entirely your responsibility and your cost to look after the maintenance of buildings it's shared amongst many people and so this is the shared kitchen and every day someone else is on roster to be cooking the evening meal which is great so you have a big cook up and uh, you get to share your meal and, and fantastic dis discussion with people at the end of the day. But it's not your responsibility to cook the evening meal every day. There are so many different examples of these kind of shared communities popping up everywhere. And they're incredibly popular throughout Europe and starting to emerge in Australia as well, but still not quite catching on yet. This is one of the, one of the amazing places that I visited uh, in Denmark which was incredibly inspiring. So basically, all of the cars were kept on the outside. So the middle of this community is a safe place. The common space within this village is so much larger because of the, without all the roads and the parking and all of the things. You know, like some cities, actually 50% of the common land is taken up by, by cars. So you get pathways and, and gardens and play spaces and areas for community buildings. So this this is a place, Horshaw, which has a diversity of different sorts of housing available from independent owner built homes to apartments to community housing to co-housing. And within each cluster of housing, there is a community house. So the curved roof building up on the top right there is one of the community houses. And this in there, they have a shared community uh, kitchen space and a meeting space. And so there's this opportunity for community that happens. So it's not just everyone stuck in their own little private units. Um, the design of these places is actually towards cultivating community, which is absolutely brilliant. So, you know, this each each cluster of houses is surrounded around a village green. And that encourages people to come out and have that, you know, there's the there's the shared playground and there's the shared buildings. There's also um, opportunities for shared growing and, and um, share care of animals. So one particular cluster has this um, chicken co-op. And so basically the members who are part of this and you don't have to be a member. It's nothing about it being forced, but it's an opportunity for this to happen. So there's this uh, chicken group who look after the chickens and once every 14 days it's their turn to go down and feed the chickens, make sure they're okay 
and to collect the eggs and that way you get all your eggs you need for your two eggs and uh, then it's someone else's turn. These sorts of things really help to create community because it's a project together. It's something that people are working on together. It doesn't mean you're having to be side by side, slaving away, doing a whole lot of hard work. It's just something simple that connects people for a common purpose, but also for personal benefit too, because you get the eggs. So there's this sense of collect collective um, intention embedded within the design of this place, but also opportunities for the community to determine how, what sort of projects they'd like to do. So one of the other things that I found really interesting about Horshoi is that they have a shared farm in the middle. They actually pushed all the houses further away, which meant that uh, the farm in the middle uh, was able to be of significant size, that it could produce most of the food that this community needs. And all of the wastewater and the waste nutrients flow down into this farm and then the produce comes back up and, and it gets shared to each of these different community houses. So you would pay for that. If you wanted to go down and help in the farm, then you could do that and, and maybe get free food. But it, it takes out so much of that ecological footprint of our food system, which is a significant part of, of, our, of our footprint. And it also takes away the waste because our waste water and our waste food scraps and even even in this community, uh, the human manure goes back into uh, the community food system. So the human manure, of course, is not going on the vegetables. It gets buried in underneath the, the um, orchard area. And they even collect the urine. So that gets sent collectively down into a woodlot area. Um, and then they coppice so that woodlot regularly and it gets sent up into a, into a very efficient uh, chippy heater which gets sent around to all of the homes as central heating. So by taking out the cars out of the settlement there's this possibility for so much happening and so much more neighborhood connection. A similar type of project uh, but one that predates Horshoi is Village Homes in Davis, California and what I really loved about this place when I first went there was noticing the what happens when you take away the fences in a neighborhood. So there was this much more open sense and a collective space, um, beautiful gardens which just seemed to stretch and connect all the different homes. And it, it felt like all the different homes were set within this beautiful edible oasis. Um, absolutely remarkable considering this is quite a dry area. So they'd sunk all of the water into the landscape and growing lots of street trees. And um, so for example, the street trees are mostly almonds and they collect seven tons of almonds which what they don't use then they sell and that then helps fund other projects in and amongst their community they have orchards all the way through the landscape again this is a car free uh, community meaning that the cars come in the back and park behind the houses housing clusters but all the central parts are, are car free which means it's safe for children it means that there's um, probably 40% of this landscape is now for gardens and edible landscapes that's managed together collectively. So there's there's vineyards and there's orchards and there's edible street trees and community gardens and oh, so much happening. So the kids know where all of the best fruit trees are and, and what's on season at the time. Um, in, in between the housing areas where normally there would be roads in a standard suburb, there are parkways and there's barbecues and playgrounds and veggie gardens and herb gardens. So you can see this this way of thinking differently about what we assume has to be a road. If we can turn that into a garden, what difference that can make. And I've seen that too in, a, in a Manchester where in quite a, a poor community, one of the social workers suggested actually that they put bollards at each end of the street and start to rip up the pavement and put in gardens there and it transformed that place immensely they started to build uh, playgrounds and seating areas and put in like this fruit trees and gardens and so I wonder what could happen in your community is there a spot where you could possibly um, reclaim some road or whether you could use some of the verge or think differently about what's happening in your local parkland or could you possibly take down some fences with your neighborhood neighbors and and open up that space 
I notice here when um, even at Crystal Waters, we don't have fences either between it. And it's such an important part here, particularly with the with the wildlife. We have kangaroo pathways that that just traverse through the places. If we start to have fences, we'd completely disrupt the the way in which the other species engage with this place. So the way we manage our landscape at the moment is so human focused, obviously. But if we start to think about how we can open it up and make it a more a naturally flowing place. Now we worry about security, but what happens when we start to have uh, more community? There's more eyes, there's more people in the landscape. When we're more working locally from home and there's people around, there is less of a security issue. It's when we, we vacate the homes and we disappear off into, into our workplaces and our school places and our homes are empty all day that that is more of an issue. So when we start to inhabit our places differently and we start to be more home-based with our work or maybe even home-based with our school and think more about how we can be more engaged on an everyday basis with where we live and that that is the place where our food's from or our, even where we where we choose to spend our time to to recreate. Things change. There's an interesting place too in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, where an apartment building, it's kind of like a, a rectangular apartment building and in the middle of that they have uh, permaculture gardens. Each one of the little apartments is kind of like Horshoi in a way that each of the apartments is someone's place but there's shared spaces for eating and shared places for laundry and shared places for gardening and composting and for bike repair. And they, what they do is even they um, regularly close off the street in front of them and have a big uh, feast. They take the tables out into the street and people enjoy from not just their community but the neighbourhood around come out and start to enjoy this public space. And we've noticed that this is happening too, uh, particularly in COVID in some of the cities that where people are bringing their tables out onto their onto their nature strips and and having a shared meal even though they're doing the social distancing so we're starting to do this now even though we don't have so many of these sort of cooperative housing models but the lessons from them and the inspiration from them I think is really important to create this sort of thriving idea of 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 doing things together and doing things differently and doing things more locally I was also recently in Findhorn in Scotland, which is a very well-known eco-village and sustainable community that's been around for many decades now. And it has a more recent part of it here that you can see. This is some of the the, the new parts of the, the community, which are co-housing, clusters of houses. Again, similar kind of model around having um, a shared meeting spaces, some shared kitchen spaces, but also that there's a co-design, that there's been intent in, and this is where the intentional community comes from, there's been intent in how it's designed, that people get involved in the design of, of how the place looks and, and in creating the principles in which they want to live so that it, you know, it's powered by the sun, that the waste water and waste nutrients flow back into the into the soil they have shared composting systems and a rehydration of the landscape there's also within intentional communities like this shared um, special places and and one that's at Findhorn is a, a shared meditation space so this beautiful little um, earth covered hut um, this natural shaped building built out of the local materials around there people meet there every day uh, for a morning meditation and so that's one of the things that connect. Now, every community has the things that they connect around. It could be around um, a, a shared gardening or shared meditation or shared tree planting or shared cooking or what is it that you in your neighborhood can collectively do together that brings you together in a way that you start to see what's happening around you. You start to connect more with your local place, with your local community, with your local environment, and you start to notice what's going on and you start to imagine together things that you could do to to make positive transformations in your community. And often, you know, I hear people getting together in groups to talk about this. But what I found seems to be the most successful ways when people just start getting together and doing something together 
and by working together on some kind of project, whether it be a community garden or a community tree planting or community composting, that that act of doing something together builds those relationships and connections even deeper. And one place that I would really love to that I thought was something worth sharing is Tori Sapiri Ori. Now this is a medieval, well the origins of this particular village is from the medieval times. It's a bit hard to see from here but there's three rows of houses here stacked up on the hillside uh, in um, just not far from the border with France uh, near a place called Ventimiglia and over the last few decades this community has revitalized this village. It was almost abandoned. I think there was maybe one person or two people still living in this village but it, like many um, old villages around um, the Mediterranean this had been pretty much abandoned and so had the terraces around it too. So this community came in together and they've decided to restore it as a community place and now uh, it's fully um, functioning and half of the community so the left hand side is all apartments and so they reconfigured all of the rooms there to create little apartments where people would have um, you know some bedrooms and uh, of different size so maybe one bedroom or two bedroom apartment with a little kitchenette and a bathroom but not a full kitchen and on the right hand side uh, that's where the community kitchen the community meeting space the community enterprise spaces happens uh, and so they have um, a, an air, sorry, they have a B and B, not an Airbnb. They have a B and B that they run as an eco guest house. They run courses and workshops there. They do arts and crafts and music, and food preparation and all a whole range of different things. It was even at one point the um, the the home base for the Global Eco Village Network of Europe. Um, when I visited there. A few times we ran programs on eco village design and permaculture. Uh, so this particular village has a thriving community based around the fact that they meet each day to cook and eat together, and also that what ties them together is the sh are the shared social enterprises of looking after and managing the guest house in all of its different um, all of its different aspects. And so again, that shared purpose gives them a sense of deep connectivity with their place and with each other. And over time too, they've started, you can see just below there, they're starting to do some gardens there, but they've gradually been piecing together um, bits of the terraces around them that had been abandoned and just left fallow for years and, and re-instigating those as, as permaculture gardens and um, terraces with olive trees and some of them ancient olive trees and bringing them back to life as well and creating food forests on those terraces. So once you start to work together in one way, you start to expand your awareness out further and start to think about what else you can do and also what you can do in the world. So this idea that from thinking about what, how they can restore their own buildings and create their own community, they also then started to share out their lessons with the world about how to do that as well. So it's not just about you and your own place. It's about you and your place and the world. <laughs> and, I, and I really see that happening when there's this greater sense of identity as a community as opposed to just identity as an individual or as a family. And there's some so many different places uh, all around the world experimenting with different ways of creating community within the Global Eco Village Network itself. They are aware of at least 10,000 different communities of all different kinds. This is another one. This is an off grid community in Wales, and it's actually supported through a, a model, uh, a in, really interesting model that's coming from um, within the government, too, which is called One Planet Development. So within Wales, if there's a piece of land that's away from services and facilities uh, and you'd like to create a community there, you can. You can go and live in, in those places. So you can go and buy a piece of land as long as you are independent in terms of your energy systems, your waste systems, and you're having a low impact. So it's this, you're living a one planet life and that you're actually 
growing food and being productive. And there's a certain series of things that you need to check off to show that you're actually living a, a sustainable and regenerative way of life. So I, I keep wondering why we can't have that kind of development model in other places too. We often get restricted saying, no, we can only have um, development in these certain zones. Whereas what about having one planet development um, not just in rural places like this, but everywhere. Let's take the one planet thinking and apply it um, to to all our communities and think about how we can help to support particularly young people to find ways that they can find cheap land and live in a low impact way and actually a way that's not just low impact, but but regenerative, that it's restoring the landscape, it's restoring communities, it's restoring habitats. And this type of one planet development thinking can help to help us to flip that around. So back in Italy, uh, this is Dumb and Her. And there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you about Dumb and Her. There's so many things to tell you about all these different places, but I'm just picking out little snippets from each. The thing that really inspired me about Dumb and Her was their economic model, where they actually... Um, think about their economy um, together as a community thinking okay so one third of our work uh, we put towards income generation one third of our work we put towards um, community development and doing community service and another third of our work is towards learning and sharing so continuously um, improving on our skills and going out and learning something somewhere and bring it back and sharing it with other people. So that was a third work, a third service, a third mutual learning. And it was it's absolutely brilliant. So this community has about 60 different enterprises that operate within the community. Everything from, from cheese making to um, solar panels to beautiful cloth making. So whatever they do, they do absolutely brilliantly. And that you're guaranteed a job within this system. You're guaranteed a home. Everyone is housed within this. So you, when you enter into this community, um, you actually put your money into the commons. And so then you get your education, your transport, your food, everything. Uh, so it's a shared economy in that uh, everyone, it's kind of a leveler. And I think this is something that we might need to really think about. Um, in our current situation, and particularly we're seeing a lot of younger people without the the ability to actually find a way to enter into the housing market. And with the slowing down of, of the global economy, we're seeing mass un- unemployment. So is this something, is there lessons in this that we can be learning from how we can collectively purchase land and buildings and collectively create enterprises, which means that we all have work, we all contribute and we all have housing. It's interesting to think about, and I think it's it's worth exploring. Um, this particular community is quite interesting in the fact that it has um, its own currency. So as soon as you enter into this uh, into the village, there is a you you exchange your euros for um, the local currency here, and then you use that to purchase. So it's a way of circulating your money circulating the money locally and keeping the money locally so it's not doesn't keep getting sucked out like what happens in the global economy um, they also have this incredible underground temple system which got discovered recently and this is sort of part of their uh, love in action of of community service as well coming in and creating beautiful mosaics and a beautiful place to come and and do their meditations and dance and the rituals that they have um this is a spiritual community so you know whether you like that or not uh, i actually think that this notion of having the the shared economic system and the shared purpose has such value for what we're really thinking about what we need in in the world today and this similar model too i've seen in a number of different communities that come under the yamagishi movement which started in the 1950s in japan and is spread around the world and this particular one here is in in switzerland where basically um, the a community of people will come together and buy or build um, shared housing so everyone has their own little little apartment 
or little rooms and here it's even more shared so there's no kitchens in those rooms they're just kind of bedrooms where you sleep and then you come out into the shared community space shared cooking space and the the basis of the economy for Yamagishi is all around local food so it, these are agricultural communities so again it's something you could do in finding land in a rural area and actually having a whole group of people who are creating a local enterprise around um, creating sustainable food systems. So interesting again as a way of collectively buying land and collectively creating enterprises rather than us all trying to do it individually. And what it means too is that then all of that community is fed and housed and cared for and have an opportunity for connection. And then through the collective enterprise actually generate some income which then supports all of that as well so shifting gear here thinking about rather than going and setting up a community somewhere or buying a piece of land what if you're already in a town and already in a community and you're really happy where you are what can you do to transform that place um, recently met up with Rob Hopkins who is the founder of the Transition Town Movement which actually emerged out of permaculture. He was running a permaculture course in Ireland and it was a longer term course and he set the task for his students to think about how you could apply permaculture to creating um, you know, local economic systems there, how you could revitalise the community and Transition Town kind of birthed out of that. And so it's gone all the way around the world and thinking about how to create local currencies and imagining your towns differently, imagining how you can engage with um, creating local enterprises and meeting the needs within your community uh, that aren't being met. So what, what are the things you would love to see happen? And we don't necessarily give space to that to happen normally. So the transition town actually opens up space where people can reimagine what they love about their local environment for example this was part of the project in Totnes where the river dart runs through and reimagining how you could become um, engaged in managing that bioregion and, and looking at the dart as a connective thread that weaves its way through that region they have um, local currency money which um, gets used in the local area a little bit like the ones in in um, in uh, Dam and Her to help circulate the money locally. And then there's all different sorts of imagination projects that happen with, you know, with young people. So saying the what if, and this is something that Rob's really working on a lot now is this sort of thinking about imagining the future. So one of the projects that they had was a what if wall. And, and uh, so people, kids and all different people coming and saying, well, what if? And um, Hugh, my son, joined in there and he's saying, well, what if there was no fuel worldwide for a month? So this was pre-COVID and um, pre-anything that's happening this year. And he was imagining, well, what would that do for our food systems, um, how we travel, building? And, and then when you look at that whole wall of everyone's thinking, you would start to see some connective threads and maybe some questions. You think, well, gosh, if yeah, what if? What if there was a, a global crisis or pandemic? How would, we, how would we thrive as a local community? Where are the gaps? What are the things that we feel like we could really do together to help us to thrive and help us to, to um, improve um, what's happening in our local ecological systems too? So just starting with something as simple as a what if wall or connecting people through a local environmental project or a local land care project or a local currency. It doesn't really matter what the starting point is as long as there is a starting point for connection. And then once people start to come together, it's like I was saying before, once people start to come together about one thing, then you start to see collectively the possibilities for other things to happen. So as long as you have a, like a core small group that have some interest about doing something for the common good and then share that story with other people. It starts the ball rolling and things happen from there. And then you can start to do what we call citizen design where you start to take some of the spaces in and around your local area and come together and, and reimagine and rethink and redesign what those could be. So what what is it that you can do that's for your community but it's designed by you as a community and maintained by you as a community and something like North East Street City Farm in Brisbane is a fantastic example of that 
how a community took this four acre piece of land right in the middle of the city and transformed it into a food forest and an organic farmer's market and a place which now has that employs many people and produces abundance of food and educational opportunities and uh, is has a, a nursery that helps to ripple out the um, beautiful edibles edible plants throughout the neighborhood so it becomes an inspirational point that then helps to transform what's going on as well but as soon as people start to design together and think together about their shared space, something changes. And that is part of the key of creating that thriving characteristic of a neighborhood, not just a place to live and not just a place to have a house and your own plot of land, but to where things start to shift and happen and um create beautiful places and community gardening is an obvious one of that where it's a place where a community garden is really about growing communities and it's way more than just about the food the food is the starting point the food is the neutral thing which brings you together and I think that's the key thing what is it that is a really open and neutral and fun thing to do together it could be having a shared meal it could be doing a shared gardening it could be um, you know doing a bit of a tree planting down the end of the street it could be having um, closing off your um, your street if you can if you're not in a main road and having a, a community party why not once a month and you know potluck uh, what is it that you could do with your neighborhood that could transform how you all feel about the space in which you are and so the global eco village network talks about this in terms of you know this idea of eco villages is, is is not just about you know how you know in the standard thinking an eco village is a kind of a rural place uh, where people go and build eco homes a bit like crystal waters in a way but that's just such a small and tiny part of what this whole movement's about it is about citizens people reimagining themselves as citizens of a place of a neighborhood and and engaging in creating projects together so you can see here there's like eco citizens and eco projects and getting engaged in in schools and other um, local organizations which collectively brings together a sense of being part of an eco community or neighborhood uh, and those neighborhoods together start to cluster and create eco cities and then eco regions and so if we can start to imagine ourselves as citizens within these various scales we can start to ripple out and then also connect around the world with others doing it and the global eco village network which i'm an ambassador of the global eco village network which means basically that i offer education around eco villages and help to connect different eco village projects um, in different ways and also within the permaculture course that i run the permaculture educators program we have an eco village module that's part of that too um, if you'd like to check out some of the solutions, they have a the Global Eco Village Network has a um, remarkable website that has so many different um, eco villages listed on there, and also lots of different um, solutions or projects that people are involved with. So you can see that there, solution.ecovillage.org. You can check that out and find out so many different ways you can get started. And the Global Eco Village Network um, has at least 6,000 um, connections throughout the world and they've identified well over 10,000 communities that they know of in 100 countries. So this is a, a massive global movement. You might also like to check out um, Gaia Education's Eco Village Design Curriculum. You can actually um, download it for free as if you're just wanting to have a look at it. You can see the curriculum that all the different uh, features of uh, the worldview, the social, ecological and economic aspects of designing eco villages. Uh, so that's available to you there. So go to GaiaEducation.org and I'd like to also let you know too about um, Fritjof Capra's running a course about systems thinking and the core about what Fritjof is talking about is about creating sustainable communities. Essentially that the more that we understand more deeply the systems view of life, 
the more we're able to live more with nature. So he said, a sustainable human community is designed in such a manner that its ways of life, technologies and social institutions honour, support and cooperate with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. So if we're to sustain life on this planet, we need sustainable communities. And if we to create sustainable communities, we need to rethink the way in which we live, the way in which we connect. One of the best places to start too with creating sustainable neighborhoods and communities is permaculture. I mean, it's one of the most accessible design systems that's that's available. And right at the core of permaculture is earth care, people care and fair share. And, and these are the 12 um, permaculture design principles that if we apply these in different ways, it helps us to design with nature. So I really encourage you to if you're not already, um, finding out, find out more about permaculture and permaculture design and how you can apply permaculture, not just to your backyard, but to your neighborhood and your community and beyond. And there's also a set of eco-village design principles that the Global Eco-Village Network have put out. So these are um, articulated here and you can find these on the ecovillage.org website. They even have a set of eco-village cards which are really fantastic to do to, to work with a local community. So if you get a set of these cards, you can then start to imagine, you can kind of gamify the way that you do it, create these different um, discussions around the different principles. Uh, so these are looking at um, social economic ecological worldview and cultural elements of communities and how you can use these principles to start to transform how you living in community there's another organization um, called bioregional and they've created this one planet living clearly articulated set of principles why i'm suggesting all these two is because if you've got a group of people that you're thinking about working with in your local neighborhood it's really a great idea to have a look at these different principles the permaculture principles the um, the eco village principles these one planet principles um, and to identify what it is that you think would be really valuable for your local area as a catalyst for creating change and, and imagining where you'd like to go so if you'd like to um, there's, there's a whole lot of background information to each of these and so I've put the links there so check out these ones at bioregional.com and these were the ones that were behind um, the eco village uh, or eco development called BedZ in the UK and there's another fantastic set of um, principles too coming and it's called the Living Community Challenge from the Living Futures Institute uh, and so they talk about imagining a community um, as connected as a forest ecosystem and what are the principles that are required uh, to explore to really think this through so they've talked about place and beauty and equity and thinking about um, the life cycle of materials and health and happiness and um, being energy positive and water positive so really beautiful principles that help to underpin how we may th be able to rethink um, what we're doing in our neighborhoods and there's many references too that I'd like to share with you so um, the eco village book by the global eco village network um, edited by kosher and Layla um, that one has a whole series of fantastic examples of different types of communities and projects and then of course there's retro suburbia David Holmgren's book about how to take permaculture and eco village thinking into suburbs and transform them you know pulling down the fences sharing doing all those sorts of things that I've been talking about but in a suburban context there's another book by the um, Gaia Education which is Eco Villages Around the World which is another set of brilliant examples of ways in which to uh, live in sustainable neighborhoods and then I really wanted to point you to as well to Rob Hopkins book from from what is to what if unleashing the power of imagination to create the future we want which is um, Rob's most recent book after his whole series around transition town books so definitely get your hands on that as well if you're really looking for inspiration about where to go so in order to create thriving neighborhoods let's just have a look at some of the key things that we've been exploring throughout this you know firstly really connecting with place and, and caring for place and feeling a sense of I don't know there's a stewardship there that it's not just oh well I'm living here for a bit and then I'm going to move somewhere else when we when we have that disconnection and we don't really land in place 
then it's really hard to actually feel the commitment to to put in the effort and the work into the community and into the environment so finding a way to to move away from that and actually we've been forced to haven't we because we are in place and we are so local we we aren't able to move around very much and so by caring for the place that we're in gives us a chance to really start to to think in a longer term and once we start to think in this longer term and imagine together the possible futures that we can create things shift and by playing together having fun together laughing together um, you know pulling down some of those sort of barriers that we put up around ourselves we start to see each other become more friends with one another we start to trust one another more and we can then start to imagine in a different way again and eating together is something that helps us to get to that point eating together and playing together these conversations and and the connectedness in a way so it's not just talking head to head it's talking heart to heart and when we can get into that place and we can start to find that we're not only caring for place but we're caring for others in our community and reaching out to other people and we've seen an enormous change in how we our neighborhoods are caring for one another um, during COVID time so let's keep that going and let's keep this sense of place and connectedness Um, and allow that to ripple out and perhaps there's a shared project that we can engage in that can help to spark um, the action and I think once we start to work on something together rather than just talking about saying that's a nice idea when we start to do something together then our imaginations for the possibilities uh, start to ripple even further now we can do other things too like sharing things it could be as simple as having a tool library or a toy library or you know the simple sharing of clothes and resources or it could be that we have um, a a shared car system many of the eco villages that I've been visiting recently have uh, like a shared car system there's an app that manages it and they're all electric vehicles so not everyone has to own all this stuff which sits idle most of the time is actually a way of being more ecological but also more community connected and that's where this sort of thriving part that we can actually live on less live on less money we can live on less um, ecological resources and find more connectedness through this and once we start to get a sense of this togetherness then we're able to look beyond together as well and see how what we're doing is impacting on the planet or on other cultures or other places and it can also help us to reach out and support other groups to be able to to get started or to reach out to other groups in other parts of the world who may need support these seven points together i think are really helpful for us to uh, to imagine how we can transform our place and i'd like to encourage you to continue to you know make sense of of what's going on in this changing world and join me in my weekly podcast Uh, recently had Kosha Joubert who's um, the the CEO of the Global Eco Village Network or was until the uh, I think my podcast was her last uh, last interview in that role she's now moved to a related role in a different organization Um, but anyway um, so join me in the podcast. I've spoken to David Holmgren and Fitchoff Capper and Kosha Joubert and many different people I'll be interviewing over over um, every week to, to explore this. How can we make sense in this changing world? And it is mostly about how we can live in more sustainable communities. And this is the focus that we're taking. And I also encourage you to dive into the youtube channel that i've created there's well over 150 different films there or very practical things about how to live in place how to grow food um, how to make different things and also tours to different people's places and also different eco villages Um, and connected with that too is my blog so there's probably well over 400 different articles within there now that you can explore um, that can support you uh, and your neighborhood in doing practical projects and if you need something a little bit more substantial to uh, you might want to dive into 
the online permaculture gardening course which I have and you can see here the different modules uh, so creating superb soils making a garden growing abundant food um, setting up a food forest and superfood garden medicinal garden beauty garden tea garden and then how to actually use that in 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 cooking a lot of the more unusual food so that's the incredible edible garden course and also I run a something called the Permaculture Educators Program, which I know many of you um, know about or are already part of. But I wanted to let um, others know too that this is available because essentially it's a, it's a dual certificate course that's available online and you can start anytime and take as long as you want. And really it's about supporting you to find a way to transform your place and your neighborhood and to create local work. Uh, in permaculture so this is this is perhaps something that you might want to look at if you're really thinking okay at this time in the world I need to be thinking about working differently I need to be thinking about how I can help to support thriving neighborhoods and communities and how that we can work towards one planet living I mean, really, that's what permaculture is all about. So that's what the course is. It's a permaculture design certificate and a permaculture teacher certificate with also ecological business models in there too of how to set up your own um, small social enterprise. And also part of living in sustainable communities is about supporting other communities. And so we have a permaculture charity and we've been working particularly lately with um, different groups of women and also refugee youth uh, in helping to create local gardens because that's really where the key focus has been at right now, particularly with COVID and the shift and change in the way that the food system is um, not supporting people in these places. So um, we've been helping to get the young refugees um, kitchen garden kits and also supporting a group of women um, to actually to buy a piece of land that they can create as a community farm and community education center in Kakamega. So I so welcome um, your donations to support this work. Uh, we Every single donation goes directly to the communities. Um, I don't take out any fees to cover the Ethos Foundation admin. I cover that personally. So every dollar that you donate goes straight to these projects, which helps them to create and determine their uh, local regenerative community projects. So masterclasses happen, as I said, right at the very beginning, every month, and the topics are open for the next four months. So I'd really like you to type in the chat or below if you're watching this later, what are some of the topics that you'd like me to explore? And then I will um, start to match those to these dates. So um, Put these in your diary and I'll start to get these um, notifications out soon so you can book into these. So there'll be August 24th, September 28th, October 26th and November 23rd. So it's always the fourth Monday at 8 p.m. Um, Brisbane time. And I look forward to hearing your comments down the side about what it is that you would like these topics to be focused on. And always, of course, something that's related to permaculture, uh, one planet living, sustainable living it could be something very practical and focused it could be something community based it could be something design based it could be something more economic based or education based let me know what it is that you're interested in and just um, again just to reiterate some of those uh, websites so if you're interested in um, the permaculture educators program that's permaculture education institute.org if you're looking for um, the information, either the YouTube or blog, that's all. You can find that all through Our Permaculture Life and also the podcast I've got linked in there as well. So ourpermaculturelife.com. Um, you can also find that on Facebook as well. And that's often where I put in daily lives. So this month being Plastic Free July, um, there's a series of daily lives all about simple things you can do to actually get rid of um, single-use plastics in your life. And the charity... Uh, is ethosfoundation.org.au. So I thank you so much for joining me today and exploring just some of the key things that I think are helpful when we're imagining how we can possibly um, create and support thriving local neighborhoods and how we can uh, imagine ourselves as catalysts for that can activate some 
projects that can build community and build a thriving sense of community in our neighborhoods so I, I hope there's something in there that's been useful i'd love it if you'd put down some comments there about some of the ideas that you think you might go away and do or something that you're already doing that you can share with people that might inspire people as well all right well thank you so much for joining me today and i look forward to the pleasure of your company another time as well i'm going to stick around here now for another 10 minutes or so um, to answer any questions that you have in the chat and I'll see you next time. Okay, take care. Bye.